So, Pamela, how are you doing? How are you? Good. Just hanging in there right now. All we can do. I know. I'm getting a message from Jill that says she's logged in, but she must be in the wrong place. I clicked on the link she sent me, so I'm not sure where she be. <laughs> Oh, here she comes. There she is. Hello. Hi. How are you doing? I was about to I was about to tell you it said that you were there and needed to uh, let me in. Hmm. Hi Diana. How are you doing? Okay. Good. Are you all doing? Are you all doing the Almas Park Terrace show this year? No, we canceled it. It would have been, uh, I guess, this weekend. Oh. Yeah. We just uh, didn't think it was worth the risk. Not so much that people coming, but just like it, we usually host artists. Uh -huh. It's a long time for the artists to be together and sharing yeah. food and bathrooms and. Ooh, that's right. So that that was the problem. We just didn't want to risk that. Yeah, I know. And we I have a lot of older artists in the neighborhood who actually thought we should do it. They were pretty <laughs> mad. I was like, "You're who we're kind of trying to protect here." <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. We're in, at Louise's house. There's all of us in there with the glass guild and her mother. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people. So, Miss Pamela, how are you today? Good. I'm very good. Just is that nice a walk. cat basket or a baby basket or what behind you? Um, it used to be for magazines and I have been working to purge the house of stuff and right now it's empty thank goodness. So it's nothing it's just it's just sitting there waiting for its new role in life. Hmm. This is actually let's see if I can turn it so you can see this is my little room of my own. I put a little chair in here. And so this is my getaway spot. Nice. So are you working from home right now? I'm retired. You're retired. Oh, good. You got to miss out on this mess. <laughs> I don't know. The guild is keeping me busy right now. I, I, I agreed to be president before the pandemic started. Oh, so that's been a, that's been interesting. In fact, I was going to tell you, um, we're doing an online sale. Oh, good. Um, we've set it up on our website, and SAMA is going to help us promote it with their members. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you or any of the artists that are in your studio, the deadline was really last night. But, you know, my goal is for folks to have exposure. So if you or anybody want to participate, we're not providing the shopping experience. It's just a link to shops. So you have to have your own whatever so just like what clayfest did pretty much yes yes yeah. although yeah. some folks are just linking it to their instagram account and saying dm me if you see something you like so it can be pretty low tech mm -hmm. um you know and some people have stores so um you have to be a member but it's only 35 dollars. so if you know of anybody um we've got two glass artists that are that they i think they are always have always been members with the guild mm -hmm. um and then we have one group of Ugandan, I don't know, <laughs> beetle something or other um, that is that is being sponsored by Lydia, our member, and it benefits, I guess it's made by and benefits the women in Uganda. Oh, so anyway, okay. yeah. we're, we're not really restricting it to clay per se. I, I, I'm trying to be pretty low key about it. So that's good. This yeah, I think a, I think that's a good way to go. What the Clayfest did was just like we're going to be the avenue to disperse the work, but we're not going to be uploading images and maintaining yeah. a store. Yeah, <laughs> and that's well, that's a lot of work. <laughs> did you do Clayfest this year? I paid the fee, but I ended up like, oh, okay. I can't. So it was I, a lot. I mean, I did it with Benner. Um, uh -huh. I mean, not my work, but I helped him through it, and you know, it's just a lot. So yeah. Um, I put up a thing with people could sign up for my email list and that I would do a special sale pretty coming up, but I just couldn't yeah. get it all done in time. Yeah, no. <laughs> the I better did well. Did he sell out? 
No, did not sell. I would say nope. about 25% of a normal clay fest. Well, yeah, it's because you could only upload so much work too. Uh, yeah, it's just not as much fun to go shop on your computer as it is to go to green and, you know, yeah, it, it was an experience. So, yeah. but you know, it was certainly better than not doing it. And, yeah. you know, and it forced you, it forced you all to get an online site. Yep. Which we had never had before. So benner has got his store. I got my store up for this thing that we're about to do. What did y'all use as a shop? Etsy, believe it or not. Okay. Cool. We have a website. I have a website on WordPress and I had been working to set up the shop with the WooCommerce and all that for mm -hmm. two years now. I don't know, forever. And it's just complicated. And yeah. Etsy, it, it's pretty straightforward. They, there's a lot that they do that I think is worth the 5% cut they take. Mm -hmm. So is anybody in the waiting room yet? Oh. <laughs> Our monitor is yakking. <laughs> Alan, Alan is our usual monitor and he's what traveling still today or are they back yet? You know, he's I been, think he's recovering from having been out of town for so long. He's been in Vermont for, what, a couple of months? Yeah. Yeah, I think he's just catching his breath. I, I wish this thing would ding when somebody shows up in the waiting room. I'm sorry, guys, that it that it took me a second to let you in. I think we'll survive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go try out this new ring light that I just bought. Oh, neat. I'm walking into the dark room. <laughs> so did you buy one of those things they're constantly advertising on the internet to put on your computer? It's just a cheap little, where does, where's my camera? It's just a cheap little thing. I have one. But let's see. Oh, you got let's... one. Cool. Uh, okay, you let's see I if it. I clearly do not have one. I have if a window behind me it couldn't be worse but let me see if i'm too light if i'm too light it'll show too much of my <laughs> age issues let's turn yeah it down my little. room is just like leslie's that there's a light and a big fan over me and so sometimes it's really awkward how's yeah. that that's a mood lighting let's see what else we got you can almost turn the light off on um, from the ceiling fan leslie oh okay We'll see. Maybe it's too, yeah, that's actually better because otherwise it was in our eyes, I think. Let me see if I can move it more centered. How's that? Is that okay? Yeah. I, I, I can't see a damn thing. It's right in my face. Can you turn down the, the intensity? I don't know. Uh, I got to move it over back over here. <laughs> uh, I, I can't tell you how sick I am of all this shit. God. Oh. Only another year to go. Oh, don't say it. Mm. <laughs> well, luckily, we're going to hopefully get a plan and instigate it pretty soon. Yeah. Yeah. At least we have a chance. Yes. Instead of, oh, it'll we'll just go away. It'll, it'll go away. <laughs> Magic. It'll it's just... almost nothing. It's almost nothing. <laughs> I don't think he said almost, did he? <laughs> I think he said nothing. I'm not sure. Okay, so ever... we have a lot of people registered. Hopefully they'll get on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Isn't it but funny how people are late to Zoom meetings? It's like, really? <laughs> You're here. I got stuck in traffic. <laughs> right. And there's so many of them. I keep standing them up just for Yeah, getting. I keep missing them too. Even though they're on my calendar, they're just not in my mind. Yeah. Where do you, why? Like I don't have any. <laughs> Of course, I don't do anything, which is oh, why yeah, I don't I have any. Yeah, on Zoom, so. Uh. Now, Diana, are you teaching at college remotely or anything? Or yeah, what? everything's remote. Yeah. Yeah, or online. It's not. It's not that bad. It's. It's bad in that I had. I've completely rewritten all my classes this semester, so because oh. they're online. So. Yeah. It, that was a tremendous amount of work and I'm still fleshing out the drawing classes, but next semester I'm really excited because they should be a lot more on autopilot and I'll just be adding to instead of creating. So what classes um, are you teaching? Uh, I'm teaching two different classes in two different formats. I'm teaching drawing all online. So that means it doesn't meet at all. And then I'm teaching drawing on zoom. 
And then I'm teaching art appreciation online and art appreciation on Zoom. Cool. So, so y'all aren't, aren't trying to do any ceramics classes or anything then? We will online. be in the spring. Paul's going to teach. Really? The um, they're, they've reset the, the school. They went in and cleaned it out. And I think they have half the class will come one day and half the other. So they can oh. spread out more. And then uh, do yeah. some things at home and some things uh, face to face. It sounds like a mess to me. <laughs> so. Does anybody know how the classes went at the School of Art? Or how they are going? I guess they're still going. Taking one. And um, I think she's glad she's taking it, but there's really very little opportunity to work in the studio. You get, I think, your class time, and that's it. Right, that's what I, that's what this is. Your lecture time, so yeah. Um, you know, I think you can stay a little bit after, maybe an hour or two. Maybe I don't know, but she's saying it's, it's pretty limited. Yeah, yeah. Boy, that's bad for beginners. I mean, it's bad for everybody, but if you don't have a studio and if you don't have experience, I don't know how you can learn. But I guess you take what you can get. Yeah. There's 25 people registered. There's only six of us on. <laughs> oh, it has pushed a lot of people to, to uh, build a studio. I've seen. Melba got her studio built, right? So I only see four people. I'm oh. going to talk. I'm going to talk about upcoming programs then, and then before Pamela talks about the um, um, online what sale, call it? the online sales site. Uh, because John Nelson is scheduled for next month and he's going to do a horse hair firing and hopefully it'll be cool enough that he's um, comfortable doing that mm -hmm. instead of burning up outside. Yeah. Um, Wait, you mean at his house or online? He's, On going, to, he's going to Zoom it. Okay. So um, we're, we're just assuming everything is on Zoom for, um, sure, sure. because the pandemic's getting worse. Yes, it is. So actually in Texas, I don't know what, what sites you guys monitor, but I, I monitor one that gets down to the county level. And Dallas Fort Worth is just terrible. My daughter's up there in school and Dallas Fort Worth oh. and El Paso are just horrible. San Antonio's doing okay. But mm. so Don came up with an idea to get all the people that don't want to wear masks, how they could uh, how the new president could convince them to wear masks. And that is? He's muted. Are you gonna talk, Don, or are you standing away? Okay, anyway. No, I, I, th I thought it would just be a uh, reverse psychology for people to uh, put I hate Biden on their face mask. Maybe in that case, they would need to wear it. So he was going to suggest that um, and that he thought that maybe that would work uh, to be effective. Don is a psychologist. This isn't just some random thought. Um, I, I but think that's the perfect way to get a lot of people to do it. I think they have MAGA masks. Say, I voted for Trump and all I got was this lousy Biden mask. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect. Oh, that's great. So, uh, Dave Chappelle hosted Saturday Night Live. Did, I don't know if y'all saw that, but he said, I've got to get the wallet out of my pocket. It's bugging me. He said something really interesting. He said, remember how you felt four years ago when Trump was uh, voted in and how lost and defeated you felt he said, remember that the people who voted for Trump are feeling the same way now. You know, he was asking for a little understanding, you know, which is interesting, but you know, screw him. I'm not going to, but I think it's a great idea. You know, Benner's not, he's not, he doesn't post a lot, but he does a little bit. And I, I think he was on Facebook and there was some, it was a Potter person, not a San Antonio Potter person, I don't think that was posting these horrific images. It was like Trump with his head cut off and blood uh, coming out and oh, no. you know, it was just awful. And he was yeah. saying nasty things and Benner, he, he doesn't really get involved, but he sat back and said, you know, we don't need that. You know, mm -hmm. we just don't need that. 
No, not at all. Good idea. So let me let me ask y'all. There's Betsy. Um, let me ask y'all about some other programs. Denise Martin and I had talked at one point about her doing something about design and design sense. Since she did the, y'all pronounce it for me, the Maholica, Maholica, how do you pronounce that? Um, 30 different ways. Oh, well, okay. And, and she would be good. She's good with design. Okay. Yes, she is. And, and she's doing some really splendid designs with glass. And so mm -hmm. between them, I thought, well, gee, maybe she could talk about design. And mm -hmm. she said she might work that out. So I was going to ask y'all if that was of interest. Sounds interesting. I had a teacher tell me about, golly, 15 years ago in the ceramics studio that um, because I was frustrated because I couldn't do whatever it was I was doing. And she said, well, I couldn't play basketball when I first started. So you just keep trying. You got, it takes practice. And I've listened to that, that for the last 15 years. I wonder who that was. I wonder who that was. <laughs> I remember some things. I know my parents would have been really pleased if I had a basketball scholarship. <laughs> oh, my parents were really pleased that they could pay the tuition to get me in college period because that's the only way I got in so Not since it's 11 minutes after and I don't know where the other 25 people are that's crazy let's just assume they're going to show up at some point yeah and you know we'll, we're recording this right now and so folks that are like, oh crap, I, I, you know, time got away from me. We'll have it available for them to watch on video. That's good because I got calls in the middle of my SA 100 meeting this week of somebody, two somebody's actually who were saying, I forgot this, you know, where's the recording going to be? Mm -hmm. uh, so. so we are recording just so you guys know. Okay. Well, anyway, so Betsy, have you had a class with Diana? I'm sorry? No, but we're neighbors. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's right. You're up the street. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so we know where you live automatically then. <laughs> yeah. So um, my husband's on the line and he hasn't been around Diana very much. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about her. She is the only person I've ever met that played on a national championship basketball team, especially yeah. not a girls national championship. Over 25 years ago now. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, it was just last week. Just last Amazing. week. But I think it's so unique that you could be an art major because that's a, it seems like such a discrepancy that you're this humongous basketball player at the same time you're a, a drawing major. Yeah. And then went on to get a master's in, in fine art also with ceramics. So that's such a unique background. And if you all have not seen the interviews, there's a lot of things online about Diana lately. Um, you know, there's the Texas Public Radio's interview. Um, there's a whole list that the Glass Guild put together of all her different public art in San Antonio that you can go visit. And they put together a cool little kind of contest where you can look up uh, and see if you can find each of these different interesting pieces in it. Um, most of you all have had classes with her either at Northwest Vista, where she's an assistant professor, or at the Southwest School of Art. Um, it's kind of an, you've got kind of an amazing background, Diane. It's awesome to know you. I don't know about everybody else, but I have a bunch of her pieces that I got from the Botanical Garden when she had all those oh, water pieces. Oh, I missed that. I wanted, yeah. I have a lot of pieces, but not from there. Anyway, so Diana, you want to go on and start? And we'll yeah. just hope all these people show up. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a beautiful day and it's a everybody might be a little hungover from last night. So you okay. never know. <laughs> so I'm I'm pleased to be here and uh, it's always a, pl a pleasure to uh, share my work and I'm super excited to share my most recent project that took uh, at least three years of planning and then just about a full year to actually create and, and get installed. So um, let's see if I can share a screen here. Can someone to, uh, able allow me to share a screen? Emily has to do that. Let's see. It says one participant can share at a time. Are you not able to? It just says host disabled participant screen sharing. 
Okay. Oh, no. Well, let me. On mine, I have to go back into the setup for Zoom as to whether I can do that or not. Mine says multiple participants can share simultaneously. Let me see what else I might have, have to do. Okay, I'm going to go get some chocolate while we're doing this. <laughs> you might be able to make her a co-host. Okay, you're now a co-host. Yep, we're good. Can you share now? Yes, ma'am. Good. Betsy, good idea. Thank you. Okay, so um, I've got a lot of images here. I'm just going to go quickly. And then after I, this is done, if you have any questions, you're going to go back and look at something more closely, we can do so. No problem. Okay. So can everybody see my screen? We're in good shape. Good. Shall we wait on uh, the chocolate to come back? I'm here. Okay. All right. So um, what I've got here is just a slideshow created of uh, I'm going to minimize this. Okay, good. So this is just a slideshow created of uh, kind of from apples to nuts of this project. And I'm just showing right here the first architectural drawings and talking to the clients, uh, which would be the Pearl Silver Ventures. And, and my uh, architect that I worked with was Don McDonald Architecture. And so they gave me some ideas and told me what they were planning and gave me the initial drawings. And so I do a lot of things pretty analog initially to kind of figure, come up with my ideas. So just the vellum paper and, and sketch pads and, and seeing uh, what we can possibly do. And so these are just some of the earlier sketches, planning things out, um, initial drawings from the architects. So they, they planned originally to put stenciling on the building. And so that's what we tried to incorporate into our design so that we would uh, complement what was already gonna happen onto the, the brickwork. And then we started just doing sketches. Um, I, I employ Ali Visay, who is a graduate of Southwest School of Art in their BFA program. She initially came working with me about three years ago as a um, intern one summer to, to complete her BFA. And uh, we work really well together and she's extremely talented at drawing. So I take advantage of her drawing skills and a lot of times we'll sit together at a desk and um, I'm working on ideas and I'm just telling her what to draw. And she's almost like my drawing computer. So I would say, can you draw a frog at three quarter view? And she'll just whip it out. And then we kind of plug that into the ideas and the drawings. And so these are some of the initial sketches of what we we're working on. And we, we kind of fell into the idea of uh, talking to the, to the planners about what the building was about. And it, it's going, it's on Broadway. It's connecting the Broadway commercial corridor to the, uh, the existing space at the Pearl, which mm -hmm. is, as we know, is all about uh, living and working and playing. Uh, and they wanted to kind of, kind of bring the commercial business aspect of, of uh, the Broadway corridor and connect it back to the river. And so that made me think that we could use an analogy of uh, this ecological term called the riparian, uh, or it's, it's this echo zones where two echo zones overlap there's this extra vibrancy of life. And so we titled this the riparian edge and we uh, researched all the plants and animals of the San Antonio River Basin. And that's what we depicted into our mural. Mm -hmm. So these are just initial sketches and thinking about that. And then we came up with an initial plan that we ended up changing a little bit, but uh, we started thinking about like things that are in the air and things that are on the land and things that are in the water and being able to incorporate all that. And so then we're coming up with our final plans and ideas for our, our um, project. And we ended up doing two different murals. Uh, one mural was uh, 10 by 15 feet, and that's this one, and that's facing Grayson Street. And then the other mural, uh, this is sideways, sorry, was uh, 25 by 28 feet, and that's facing Broadway. So that's, that's the one facing Grayson and that's the one facing Broadway. And so uh, then we started thinking about uh, plugging in the borders and the colors and determining what those are going to be and filling in with just analog with coloring pencils. Wow. And so the size you see here of our drawings 
they never got any larger than that as far as uh, the idea and the concept development. I never work very large when I'm working out my plans. Okay, so then after the initial concept and plans get approved, then it's time to go back into the studio and work out the color palette based in reality instead of conceptual design. So at that point, then we're working with a lot of commercial underglaze colors. I have a special clay mix that's uh, two parts fire clay, Hawthorne fire clay, and one part grog. I have that mixed up in Austin and then they ship it to me on pallets. And so we're playing around with the, the clay we're going to use. We're coming up with our color palettes and then determining the final colors. Diana, do you mind if I ask a question? Please. So when you, what were your considerations when you landed on that as your clay material? What, what were you trying to, to accomplish and how did that? So how did that I've worked with this, this clay probably for about 10 years and for architectural ceramics, it's about being very durable and strong and three, freeze thaw resistant and um and also that it's uh there's one more thing oh it doesn't warp so because you're working such large scale there's no way you can really dry these things very evenly and mm -hmm. so you don't want your clay to warp as it's drying and so uh the clay particles themselves are real coarse and open and then also adding one third of it being already fired clay uh, means that we don't get any warpage in, in when we're working now the clay itself is not super plastic. It's a lot like kind of working with concrete in a way. It's not uh, in any way plastic. Uh, whenever I use my normal functional work, which is armadillo raku, uh, I feel like that's super plastic and smooth. <laughs> <laughs> Just mind boggling how smooth that stuff is. So uh -huh. uh, this is a really coarse brick clay. You should think of it as. So here's our final color palette that we, we came up with. And basically it's only two different glazes. It's a, an amber glaze that I use, and those are all the warm colors that are is over the underglaze colors. And that way I could work on such a large scale and be very confident that every time I fired it, I would get pretty consistent results. And then the other glaze we use is a kind of a turquoise coppery glaze. And if, if I put a squash yellow underglaze underneath it, then it looks a little greener. And so we, we had the two glazes to use. But at the same time, you know, my, I built a studio at my house about uh, six years ago, and uh, it quickly got too small for this project. And so at the same time, I was finding a new studio space. And this is exactly a mile from my house. It's by the almost HEB. However, it had not been used for about 25 years. And so that required uh, gutting out what was there and adding all new electrical and, um, and lighting. Um, and so while we were working and thinking about this project, we were also building a studio again. This is like my fifth studio I've built in my career. Hopefully this is my last one. So um, I'm just gonna run through that. We had to put in a firewall. So now we're working on getting determining the exact size of the space and the, how much depth we have to embed our ceramics. Um, the, the architects or the builders built a little mock area. So we kind of got an idea for what the brickwork surrounding the piece would look like. And then we started making a, a bunch of molds. Um, you know, in my pottery work, I use sprig molds, which are tiny little molds that you load with clay and stamp onto the pots. Once you start working at this scale, I don't think you can call them sprigs anymore. So these are just press molds, uh, giant press molds. And that was my biggest concern is I wanted to capture the liveliness of my pottery at the small scale and kind of continue for everything to have that vibrancy and that, that immediacy of being worked in wet clay at such a large scale. Um, and so I think we accomplished that, but that was one of our, our big things like, normally I'll push clay around with my thumbs, but at that scale, that wouldn't have shown up at all. So we had to make a, a big uh, uh, clay thumb and we fired it. And so we used that whenever we were doing drawing through the, through the clay. So I also wanted to, uh, I had all these animals and insects um, that I wanted to depict in the mural, but I also wanted to make sure that they didn't get kind of stale. And so I decided to go ahead and make a bunch of 3D models of the animals at a smaller scale, and I would use those models whenever I was sculpting the bas relief on the murals. 
And that was pretty successful. I'm glad we did that. That way I wasn't looking at photographs for the bas relief. I was looking mm -hmm. at actual 3D objects and then depicting those. So that means everything got a little stylized. Um, and I think that also allowed them to maintain some kind of Chris, uh, kind of life to them. So we were working on our frogs and our uh, red-eared turtles, uh, yellow-bellied catfish, a heron, and cicada, and an American bumblebee, and a red-tailed hawk. And so then we're adding our underglazes. This is another opportunity for us to experiment with our glaze palette. And then we're cleaning up the studio. It's starting to look like maybe this is going to be possible. I've got the kiln area wired up. We've got 600 amps coming into our space now. Um, here we are with the amber glaze on, on the thing. So it's been under glaze and we put amber glaze and then we're going to fire. And we once fired everything uh, for the most part. So everything got a coat of under glaze and glaze. And then we once fired all the way to cone uh, four. And so this is more of a mid range temperature. And so we're pulling them out. And you can see this is at my studio at my house. I don't have kilns yet at the other place. Are, are these fairly solid or did you, are they hollowed out inside? They're, they're hollow, but everything's heavy. Because <laughs> yeah. we we're not going to drink out of it. So it's OK for it to be heavy. Yeah. Right? Uh, I think the thickest the clay is is maybe two inches. But for the most part, the clay everywhere is about 3 quarter to an inch thick. Mm. So I'm also doing a bunch of, uh, you know, looking and, and seeing all of, all of our other features. So we were going to use the Indian blanket wildflower as our, as our central flower. And I love this flower because no two flowers are ever alike. And there's just such variety in the way they, they are. Um, and then we're building a giant slant wall. And so that's what we're going to use to um, build the, the work on. So we got that up. And uh, we before this, what's that? Have you used this idea of a slant wall before this? Yeah, for quite a while we've been working on slant walls. Uh, I really like working vertically because you can see what's going on better, and you can see light and shadow. And also, if water is going to hit the piece, I want it to be able to drain off of it and never capture water anywhere, so that if it froze, it wouldn't be a problem. Um, I think there's. I'm going to admit somebody in here. Sorry, I just got it. Okay. Um, and then traditionally I've always put plywood on my slant walls, but the plywood absorbs so much moisture, it starts to warp. And so we experimented this time and tried something different. And so we used the exterior gypsum board uh, dens glass with um, uh, a fiberglass backing and that held up really well, no warping. Uh, it's really perfect in that it, um, we, we soap up the board before we put the clay up. And so it doesn't stay stuck very long. As it dries, it will just pop right off the board. So I highly recommend that as a substrate. Um, and then also, I traditionally am losing all my papers all the time and all my important everything. And so we also built a, a project desk. So everything got stored in here overnight. And that worked out. I didn't lose anything this time. <laughs> Um, and then we decided we needed to work with templates because we weren't going to be able to work and build everything in one go. We'd have to build it in pieces. And so we laid everything out, you know, as we know, clay shrinks. And so you have to build things bigger than they're going to be because we're going to shrink down. And so we had to do that math and then we drew it out to scale as what it would need to be wet. And so we used a uh, pink insulation foam, like inch thick pink insulation foam and taped and glued it together. And uh, we glued it together with Gorilla glue um, and then used the um, aluminum tape and that held up really well. And then drew things with Sharpie markers and then also uh, livestock markers, which are kind of an oil-based paint marker that you can get um, out in the ranch uh, supply stores um, that lay down a really good line. So um, we've made some templates for our, our bugs and our in our um, our flowers and then also all the borders and then we drew it off on a grid and so we're getting that drawn out and so this is our first piece that's going to be 10 by 15 feet um, and then we're pretty much ready to go now we built all those tables we've got our clay 
we're ready, ready to do this. That's my crew. I told them to look determined, and the only person that could pull it off was a middle person, that's Alicia Farmer. Uh, <laughs> Allie Vise is over there in the red shirt, and then uh, we also got help from Jamie Wade, who lives in San Marcos. So um, every time we put up our template, we're going to build a border around it, and that way we know exactly where um, where our clay is going to go. And so that's us putting two by fours in metal. Um, we use all kinds of things for the borders. And then we start painting with nut, with arrows and underglaze. So we soap up the board with like just dish soap. And then we paint underglaze on top. And that underglaze is going to transfer to the back of the clay. And so that way we always know what orientation is up. Um, and then we also color code that. So it's easier to assemble after things are dry and we want to put it back together. So we have quadrants that are different colors. And then I have a pug mill extruder. So we're extruding out two by 10 inch thick slabs. And then we'll run that slab through a uh, slab roller to get it a little thinner. So uh, our base slab is about three quarters of an inch thick. And then we're going to stitch and assemble that up into a giant slab. And then anytime we're going to build off that giant slab, um, we're going to cut holes and add clay so that we never have clay that's too thick. As you know, that will blow up in the firing. And then those holes also serve as kind of keys that people we can back butter thin set mortar into and then uh, put it on the wall and it, it has uh, more grab onto the wall, the substrate. Um, and you can see we draw the same grid that's on drawn onto our template is then drawn onto the clay. And that way we can pretty easily transfer the information from the template to the clay slab. And, and we just use pieces of PVC pipe cut at an angle to cut out our holes. And then uh, draw tools. So these are just pieces of Luan plywood or, or plexiglass with like U shapes cut out help give us our final border shapes. So were you kind of carving into the slab to create that shape? Well, we added clay to the slab and then we draw the tool over it. Got it. And so then it just slowly gets built up. So if, uh, the first thing is everything gets added and then you can see like, like the flowers are sprigged on and sculpted. And then we do the last thing we're going to do is some carving to take away at the end. So there's the central piece. I reckon it's about, that's about 10 feet tall um, by 10 feet wide or so, maybe eight feet tall by 10 feet wide, that piece. And you can see there's some cut lines um, in a little bit because as we're working, clay starts to shrink. And so after a couple of days, I have to kind of cut it into thirds just so it has some room to, to shrink and move. Um, and then the final thing we'll do is cut it all apart into puzzle pieces. And so after it's complete, and then those puzzle pieces, uh, we took a picture and drew of our fingers kind of what the cut marks were. So we'd have this as a reference when we're laying it back out. But that's kind of how the clay gets cut up so that it can be processed through. And then we start taking it off the wall. And then this is what it looks like after it comes off the wall. You can see how those arrows transferred. At this hmm. point, we're going to also cut it into it with the arrows and then number it um, so that we can uh, further identify it when we're ready to assemble it back together. Is it leather hard at this point? Yeah. And so we're now we're ready for the next piece. We're going to start building that up. And then uh, that's the bottom part. And then we're taking it off the wall, cutting it out. We also end up cutting some of the undercuts away and, uh, and removing a little excess clay, put it on foam, and then we're going to put it on carts uh, to dry. And it's about 110 in the studio right there. If you can tell, I'm extremely pink. It's hot. <laughs> This was, the, this was created last summer. So that's the, the draw tool that created the border. And then here we are starting to have everything uh, getting to bone dry. And we made carts so we could store all the work. Um, the carts are made with hardy board and just one by twos. 
Um, the hardy board is really great because it's absorptive and so that it will dry the clay from both sides. And that also helps prevent any warping. And then we've got it assembled up on a tabletop. This one wasn't that big. It was 10 by 15 feet. So we were able to assemble it all together all at once. Although we never really got a great shot of it because it's so big for that. But that's kind of what it looks. So then we're going to start doing all the underglazing on it. And this kid is uh, John uh, Norred Shear that helped me out. So we're getting all the underglaze on it. And now we're ready to lay out the next piece. So the other piece is, is we're processing through, we're glazing it. However, my kilns are delayed. I ordered kilns and for some reason they didn't come in on time. And so we're having to put all the work um, in the back of my pickup truck and drive it a mile to my house. And oh God. the only good thing about that was my studio at the house had air conditioning. So we would do the final glazing at the house and then uh, put it in the kilns to fire. Do you so, have any idea how many kiln firings it took you to pull this whole thing off? This big piece took uh, about, I think it was, uh, I think it was about 45 firings per kiln. I have two big kilns now. So it took about 90 firings for this big piece. <laughs> That's a few, right? <laughs> how big are those big kilns? I'll show you in a minute. They do finally come in. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Uh, I guess we can get about 12 cubic feet of uh, of tile in each kiln when we're firing. I think that's what I kind of figured out. Okay, so uh, we've, we're laying out the big piece and it's still, it's too big to lay on the floor. We can never fit it in the studio completely. And so here it is kind of bent up, but we're getting an idea of what we're going to be working with. Um, and we're a little overwhelmed that we're thinking, what did we get ourselves into? This is giant. <laughs> Uh, it, and we ended up ordering 8,000 pounds of clay and we used every bit of it for this project. Yeah. So then we're deciding, okay, we're going to cut this up um, in a way that is visually appealing so that nobody can tell it wasn't made all in one shot. And so we're, we then cut it up into manageable chunks that we can work on like a week at a time and figure out again our, some more templates. And then we start building. So uh, here we are laying out this very center piece. That's going to be the center uh, in medallion Indian blanket. This ends up being about six feet diameter. And we're starting to feel pretty good about this now. And then it fell off the wall. <gasps> so, uh, I learned from that uh. the bottom part, we did not put enough bracing up. And so it just flipped out and then the piece fell down off of it. Because if you think about that, that's probably, I don't know, three or 400 pounds of clay. And so uh, we learned our lesson and uh, I, uh, it never happened again. <laughs> we figured that out. So you'll start to notice how much bracing we have at the bottom of our, our murals from here on out. So just common tools, nothing fancy. Um, look at all that two by four bracing. Mm -hmm. So here we are building the top left corner. Got our bat. Uh, that's a cactus flower, a uh, pear cactus. There's all of our, our just common uh, tools that we use to create this. Everybody probably has that in their toolkit. Mm -hmm. And here we are rebuilding it again with all those two by fours down there. And then it comes off the wall. Um, any bat <laughs> I have, I get a chance, I, I go ahead and put it up, make a picture like this. So I have a lot of pictures like this. <laughs> All right, so now we're starting to figure this out and starting to get on a roll. Um, I had a great team of people. They Everything I asked of them, they were able to do. They, no complaints. Excuse me, Diana, and about how much time had elapsed by this at this point? So we're hitting uh, probably like July now. So we started in May. And so now we're moving into July. You started with clay in May. Yes, the design work started about three years ago. Uh, we started with clay in May and we finished with clay in January. Jeez, wow. So here we're building the surround that's gonna go around that wildflower. This is the centerpiece. These are about um, four feet oh, tall. Your kids are gonna get hurt. 
And again, we're getting the orientation right for each piece so that we can figure that out and also color coding things so we can figure that out. we saw in the big building. And then we're laying out things. So we're, we're in a full process now. We've got bone dry clay that we're under glazing and glazing and firing while we're working on wet clay. And we're just trying to kind of maintain this train um, and all these moving parts uh, without getting lost in the process. And then finally, the CPS who decided I needed to have all the telephone poles replaced all the way down the block before they give me more power, uh, finally came and did that. Um, and then my new kilns finally arrived. But sadly, one kiln got destroyed in shipping. So we had to get some parts replaced. That was a sad day. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to my next piece where I don't have to build a studio at the same time I'm doing a piece. So, but we're starting to get things out of the kiln. So this is looking good. We're excited about it. The colors are looking good. We're kind of seeing that this maybe this is all going to come together. And uh, nothing beats seeing things outside. Um, you know, you can look at it inside and you can, but once you see it with light and shadow and sunlight, then you start to really see how uh, ceramics and public art can really come alive in the environment. And so we're processing works more. I don't know how many gallons of bright red, bright yellow and uh, bright orange underglaze I went through, but it was a lot. Uh, then we glaze it. They're still working on my kilns. Finally, we get to do our first firing. So I have a couple of um, uh, L&L uh, kilns and I used, I bought silicon carbide shelves. They're pretty thin and uh, th those turned out really good. You don't have to um, put any kiln wash on them and you can flip them. And so um, they also, because they're so thin, you can get extra firing in that. So they don't take up a lot of, uh, of heat work because they are so thin and strong. So I, I think they were a good investment. So we're starting to get things coming out of the kiln looking good. And then stuff's starting to pile up and we're trying to keep track of what's what. And then finally it's time we've processed that first one all the way. So we're gonna lay it out and label it so that, and pack it up so that it can get delivered and then installed. So it's like putting together a very giant jigsaw puzzle and then finally we get it all assembled. And then um, we use uh, post-it notes, make these extreme post-it notes and their colors, their colors and they're basically made out of Tyvek material and they'll stay stuck forever. They're great, I love these things. So we color code and post everything with the post-it notes with numbers and we take pictures and that way, when we lay out again, it's pretty easy to lay this out and we can get it done pretty quickly. So here we are packing it up in plastic tubs. I've had these plastic tubs for years and years. Um, they get reused all the time. And then we just pack them vertically and file them between uh, pieces of foam and cardboard. And so then at the same time we're packing, we're loading more. And uh, this is my 3D model to make my, my 2D bas relief sculpture. And you can see I did a little artistic license. My hair and beak got curved a little bit more than it probably is in real life. Um, but it fit the, the, it fit the space better. So artistic license. Keep working. At this point, we're getting pretty tired. Um, we've we've got a few panels left, and we're just sort of clenching our teeth and getting it done. Unloading. That's a bat wing. Glazing. Callie Lerman started working with us uh, in the fall to help finish things up. But. I, I got a little cocky. So, you know, this still happens to me. I, I get cocky. I think I can do things like defy physics. Uh, this piece had a little bit of dampness to it and I just fired it anyway and it blew up. So we're going to make that again. So here we are making towards the end, making the last bit. And then the first piece is packed up. We got it all ready to go. 
And now we're starting to get really buried in finished tile. And so you can see it's just everywhere. We got dry clay everywhere, uh, finished clay everywhere. We can hardly move in the space. So we start deciding to pack up some stuff so we can get it out of the way. Uh, you know this is a big project when you have to spend $1,000 on cardboard to pack up your, your piece. So here we are packing it up. Those boxes work great though. Um, that's one of the advantages. My space has a loading dock so I can move things with a pallet instead of by hand now. So we're numbering and labeling the boxes, wrapping them up, ready to go. And finally, the day comes. So we're going to move it over to the Pearl and they put it in the parking garage for safekeeping for, for a few weeks. This was a very nerve wracking day. I was so grateful when it was over and we had it out of the studio and and handed over to the um, Masons. And then they pulled it off with a great machine. There goes the last bit. So this is the space where it's going to get installed. And that's about, I think it's, I think it's 28 wide by 26 tall. I think that's what it ended up being more or less. And then this space is 10 feet wide by 15 feet tall. And then of course COVID hit uh, over this time. So luckily when we were creating the piece, no COVID, so we didn't have to wear masks all summer and, and worry about all that. But um, this was installed starting in June. And so that was when we were kind of at the, still at the peak worries about COVID. So everybody's masking up. Um, we're laying out the work. And then the Masons were awesome, um, but they are very used to st uh, installing coursework. And so bricks are always the same size uh, going up and so now we're asking to install a giant uh, jigsaw puzzle and the first day did not go very smoothly it was frustrating for them i could hear them cursing the artist under their breath up there on the scaffold and uh, of course i can't get on the scaffold this is their job and so i'm sitting there thinking well what can i do to make this easier for them because they're obviously frustrated and uh the first day this is all they got up and it took forever and so uh, we started figuring out, well, what if we put uh, uh, lines across it with tape and number that, and then they only have to worry about the tape and they can install that in order. And now I can't believe I never did that before. I always put together like a puzzle myself. So I'm very excited about this new way of laying things out. So then we started thinking, well, what if we alternate the colors that will make it even easier to figure out and then I order on Amazon, I ordered like 10 different colors of masking tape. So it got really fast after that. And the uh, Masons were happy and we were all happy after this. So here they are installing the very last bit and uh, it fit except for a little bit of gap. And so we put in a row of brick across. And so now you can't tell that it was a little bit short and I'm not real sure why it was short. I don't know if it was my error or their error or maybe just the clay compacts down with the way we're building it. But I've, I've never had that happen, but I've also not worked at this scale. So uh, the width all worked perfectly, but the, the height was a little off. And so you can see right now they filled that in with mud, but since that time we filled it in with brick and now it looks like it was really a part of that. So now we're laying out the big piece. And again, we got to lay this one out all at once um, inside the building right by where it was going to go up. And so we're unpacking all the boxes, finally get it all laid out. And this is the very first time we've seen it completed. Um, we've never been able to assemble it together all at once. And so it's always just been imagined that it was all going to fit together. And so this was a huge relief that it actually all fit and worked out um, and we could see it. So there's my crew. They've been with me since day one, helping me out, Allie and uh, Alicia. And then you can see our alternating colors. So now all the Masons have to do is get the rows right. It's like A, B, C, D, and they could tell that everything was correct. Um, they spent a lot of time uh, laying out the arch and getting all the gaps perfectly right on the ground so that it would fit. Um, and that kind of 
once that foundation was down, then everything else went up pretty smooth. And so here are those guys. And every single tile got pulled up on a pulley system up to the scaffold. Every single tile. <laughs> I feel this guy must have been so exhausted by the end of the, the couple of weeks. Here's the masons working. And by the way, where I'm at is kind of a little balcony area. And uh, once the building's open, you can park in the parking garage and peek out this balcony area and see the work up close. So then the last day, all we had to do was sit and wait. So I invited my family out. And I love this shot because every single person in that shot is looking at their phone. <laughs> Pretty funny. The, the document of our times, right? So after the piece went up, then they grouted around every single tile. So they squeeze grout in with grout bags. And then there it is finished. So uh, since this time, I, I actually rode my bike near there today to, to get, take a look at it. The uh, fencing's completely down now, and you can walk up right up to it. You can't go in the building yet, but the, the pieces, the outside of the building is complete. And again, that's about six feet in diameter the Indian blanket wildflower. How long did it take the Masons to install those pieces totally? I think it, it took them two weeks for the first one and three weeks for the second. And does that come out of your project expenses to for the installation or is that back Some, to the- Sometimes it does. Sometimes it does. In this case, the contract was written so that I was just uh, building, creating it, and then I would deliver it to the Masons, and they had a separate contract with the builders. That's good. Yeah. And this is the one facing Grayson here, is that right? Correct. Yeah, so I think that's it for my slideshow. This is unbelievable. It's incredible. It was a lot of work, and it really... Uh, it, it, uh, it, I was fried. So <laughs> I'm just now feeling excited to see clay again. And, uh, and, uh, I feel good about it. I'm glad it's up. Um, and it was a tremendous opportunity, uh, to do that. So, and I, I learned a lot too. So I, there's, there's things that we worked out that I never would have figured out otherwise. And so, um, I think, I think we've got some processes that'll make life easier. And, uh, again, not building a studio at the same time, I can hardly wait for the next one. <laughs> It'll be a lot better. Would you do another one like that again? Uh, yeah, I think I, I would. I'd do another one, especially if I had my crew of helpers. They, uh, uh, Allie and Alicia were, were tremendous. You know, it's a team effort. It, it was, I couldn't do it on my own for sure. Um, but I think we've got the system down where, where we can build about anything. Leslie's waving at you. Unmute. It just popped up there. Um, I said a minute ago, what I said is you can come back and do my kitchen again if you feel like you need to do something. <laughs> right. Yeah, Leslie, you had to tear it out, right? To, it, oh, not all of it. Not all of it. Just some of it. Cool. Do you work that small scale ever again? I don't think that's small. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's Leslie's got a good point. That's where I got started. So uh, yeah. I did made a lot of kitchen backsplashes. Yeah. Uh, and that's where I developed a lot of those techniques. And Leslie was one of my clients. She was great. And so, um, you know, that's where I kind of learned how to work bigger and, and think, think all that through. And then with all those projects, I installed everything. So this, this is the second project, the one that via that I did right before this one, I also did mm -hmm. not install. I, I had that installed for me, but up to that point, I'd always done all the install work. And so, um, you know, I kind of learned from the ground up of how to, how to do this. So Which it, one is the VIA project? So that's at Brook City Base. Um, and let's let's see, I can show you real quick. So the Brook City Base was was important because that's when I first worked out the temperature, this new temperature to fire to and colors. Um, let me go into my albums. Let's see.
So this one again was up high and I didn't feel comfortable. Uh, this is the, the final version of it. Mm -hmm. And so these are like four by 12 feet. Um, and, and they're also at, at that higher temperature of firing and uh, let's see. Got a drone <laughs> shot. I've seen it and going by there, it's so cool looking. I just didn't know that was the VIA project. Oh yeah. Huh. yeah I haven't gotten a good shot at night of it. Okay. Last, last time I was there, I was taking pictures and the security came out and told me I had to leave. I had to have a permit to take a picture of it. And I tried <laughs> to explain, I was the artist and it didn't, didn't work. They kicked me off. <laughs> they said something about terrorism. I was like, for real? <laughs> Yeah, wow. I'm, I'm pleased with this. up close. Yeah, I'm pleased with this piece. I think it looks uh -huh. really nice. Yeah. That one we made in my studio at my house, and I had three people working with me, in my, and it was just extremely tight. So I'm really excited about the bigger space. It's much more adequate for working large scale. Hmm. Sorry, I have a lot of these, I guess. <laughs> Okay. What is your next project? Um, not too much. Right now I'm working in the studio and making pots and really enjoying that time to just play. Um, I've got a little uh, public art bench I'm going to work on in the spring and I've uh, got some applications in, but I'm, I'm kind of fine with taking a little time down, downtime. I've, we did three big projects in a row and, mm. uh, I just fried. I mean, I've never been that fried. <laughs> so my body was killing me and um, I just, I couldn't do it anymore. So a good six months plus COVID and all that mess. So it's just, it's been a good time to just sort of regroup and, uh, and, and really play in the studio. My home studio, I'm turning into just pottery. And so I'm making pots in there and uh, enjoying that. And uh, I've uh, subleased my other studio space out to some a lot of the people that have worked for me and so they've got a little studio space so uh, that's reducing my overhead and uh, mm -hmm. and then also giving people a place to work that otherwise wouldn't have it especially kids that you know the kids today they they get their BFA and they also get come with that 30 or 40 thousand in debt and um, just really hard to get started in, in a way that wasn't hard for me I didn't have that student debt so I've been able to invest in equipment and studios in a way that these young people are not able to do because they have student loan bills. And so Diana. that also means they have to work full time to be able to pay for that. And so they just don't have the time to cultivate themselves like I did. You know, I worked part time in the first eight or nine years of my of my after school work because I could, you know, so that gave me time to work on my work and then obtain equipment. And, I just feel really sorry for these kids. It's it's tough. Mm -hmm. So uh, going to ask you about that leasing your renting out your room. Uh, I have a studio that I'm not using. Should I try to do the same thing? You think it's it's my kiln is 95 years old. I'm guessing <laughs> it's and, uh, <laughs> it's it's you'd have to turn it up manually every single click. Uh -huh. um, but it's a nice room. Well, why are you have, using it? Um, Are you done with clay? I'm working on it. I think so. I'm, wor I'm working on it. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not ready to admit yet, but I might be. Well, sometimes you gotta get rid of stuff so that you make room for the new stuff. You know, we we can't do everything. We have to pick what our passions are and and then go full tilt at that. Thank you. Diana, as a spectator and just a guest, I am just blown away by your presentation. It's just extraordinary. Well, thank you. And I was, wondering, I was wondering with the, like, for instance, the Pearl projects have the accolade story coming in yet because this is unreal stuff. Well, yeah, I've gotten a lot of nice feedback from that. Um, I get, I get emails uh, from people every once in a while, all, all this time. Um, you know, we haven't been able to have a grand opening because of COVID. But um, I just was uh, honored with the, uh, what is it? The Native Plant Society of Texas gave me their Artist of the Year Award thing. And that was nice. Um, and then we've got a lot of nice press with TPR and Express News wrote a nice article. 
And so, um, you know, I'm excited about it. I think when the building opens up, I'm excited too. Um, inside the building, I was commissioned to make 16 medallions that are embedded into the walls. And the walls are all brick on the inside with beautiful arches. Um, and then my medallions are embedded in the whole hallway there. And they're all of the plants and animals that are depicted on the murals. And so you'll be able to go into the building and see right at eye level and touch um, all those objects and get the colors. And so I think that will also be enjoyable for, for everybody. So. Mm -hmm. That's fabulous. I have a question going back to how you started. When I was on the uh, Texas public radio side, I guess it was, it said that you went to a Mexican pottery town and oh, yeah. uh, Mato Ortiz and uh, decided that you wanted to limit your techniques and styles and all. Before that, what, what was your work like? It was a little bit of everything. Um, you know, I, I graduated from my, with my MFA and that work was very um, sculpture oriented and personal and sacrificed. And then when I moved here to Texas, I really didn't want to do that kind of work any longer. It was important work and I'm really glad I did it. It was, uh, it, it was very um, cathartic, my work in grad school. But it, you know, I was done thinking about myself and, and my, <laughs> my personal problems. And so I wanted to kind of move further. And so, and I also wanted to incorporate more color. Um, but I spent about eight years at the Southwest School teaching and uh, in that eight years, I taught over 100 different classes of different techniques and temperatures and everything. And so that was my real education. I learned a tremendous amount teaching all those classes. Mm -hmm. um, but towards the end of that, I did go, uh, I traveled with the Southwest School. They took a, a trip to Mata Ortiz. And it was there that it really dawned on me that the reason why the artists in this little village that were pretty much all self-taught were so phenomenal was because they were they did limit their materials to what was immediately around them. And, and so in our education system here in the US, any temperature you want, any technique we want, any material you want, we just order it on Amazon, right? And so we become kind of dilettantes and everything, but we don't become really proficient and good at anything because we have all this available. So if we self-limit, and we say, okay, so, and that's what I did. I said, okay, I'm only going to fire at this time. I was only going to fire low temperature. I was going to use three glazes and then I was going to use my under glazes and sprigging was going to be my main technique. And let's just see what happens. And so for 10 years, that's pretty much all I did. So I have an amber glaze, a green glaze and a turquoise glaze. And then I use my under glazes and I use my sprigging technique and draw tools and, um, by putting the blinders on and just saying, that's it. That's all you have available. Let's see what you can make happen. Uh, that allowed me to develop my own style and my own way of working and a depth of knowledge that I wouldn't have had if I kept jumping around. So I think there's a time to jump around definitely early in your education, but then there's also a time to narrow focus and determine you only have so much time on this planet. So what are you going to get really good at? And, and, and that it speaks of you. And so that trip to Mato Tis really was a turning point um, by seeing that. Because it's phenomenal what they do with so few techniques um, and have developed that just, just a high art. Hmm. When I read that, it was really astonishing to me because my glass studio reflects every class I've ever taken, every technique, every other artist. And when I go in now going, oh, I really would like to work, I'm just torn in a thousand directions and never do anything. Mm -hmm. So when I, <laughs> I, yeah, I think that's a common American experience. I, I really do. And it's not the tradition of pottery. I mean, if you think about potters all over the world, it really was immediately what was around you made your pots. And that's why different ethnicities and time periods had such distinct work because they didn't, you know, they didn't get it shipped in from Amazon. <laughs> that's really unusual. <laughs> right. Hmm. Interesting. Very. Damn, you know, I'm, not, I'm not a purist because I wouldn't say that I'm only using local materials, right? I'm still using materials from other places. I've just really severely limited them. So it's still artificial. 
I'm not just like saying I have to dig it all out of my backyard. Although I think that is a legitimate way of, of thinking about your work. And, and some people have taken that and making beautiful work doing that. Um, that wasn't what I decided. I just decided to limit some things, right? Diane, I, I, I love the aspect of going through the bridges and going down Broadway uh, and seeing your work. I can always say, you know, I know the artist, <laughs> which yeah, sort of brings a smile to my face. So it's great. <laughs> You've done a super job. Well, thank yeah. you. Thank you. I yeah. feel very fortunate to land it in this city at this time. I think it just, you know, the way my work developed and the way the city developed with their public art program, it kind of really fit in nicely for me. It seems to me that that the explanation of how you develop this would be of interest to all kinds of groups, not just art groups, because it's really mm -hmm. kind of fascinating. Um, not kind of fascinating, very. I mean, how <laughs> who, who uses, what was it, 8,000 pounds of clay um, for a project? <laughs> yeah. Well, if you yeah. planned ahead and had, had the slideshow obviously in mind and all the photographs and that, that's perfect. The, well, the that's thing. another beautiful thing about our era is digital photography is so nice, right? Mm -hmm. So I took those pictures as we were going on my phone. They automatically uploaded to my Google Photos. I didn't have to worry about that. And it's so easy to assemble an album. I mean, I'm a, I'm a child of, you know, take slides with the wrong film, with the wrong lights, everything <laughs> messed up. So I'm very grateful for digital, <laughs> digital. <work. laughs> and then like, even if you go into my Instagram, you can find different projects by hashtags. So hashtags, I think are really nice, mm -hmm. great things. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with social media. Definitely. Does anybody else have other questions for Diana? Mm -mm. So y'all gonna take on a big project? Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> you learned enough to know you don't want to do that. <laughs> uh, I have a project sitting in my so-called studio and it's been there since March. So I don't think so. Yeah, it, it's a weird time. You know, there's a lot of inertia and, and we've just, I mean, we're all a little depressed and um, you know. Got better yesterday, got better a few days ago. Or what is this? Yeah, yesterday. <laughs> wow. Hopefully wow. we can see some moving head on, on some of this COVID. Yeah. 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 So just so, hang in there. You know, it's it's not this is a weird year. Mm. And you know, we don't have to be super productive. That's that's another thing I'm just like this is this is an off year. <laughs> so, <laughs> we just need to survive, right? <laughs> For a better time. In the meantime, maybe we could go make all the masks Don was talking about, patent them and sell them all over the country. <laughs> Get there, there first. Go. There you go. <laughs> so Diana is a past president of this organization and she's been really generous with her time with us over the years. The last time she spoke to us, she uh, brought in a trailer and a uh, what would you oh, yeah. call the the portable uh, exhibit booth? I guess you yeah. Call it. What do you all call it, Diana? That's right. I haven't you know I haven't used it for about three years because I have not made pots in three years because of this wow. project, the last project. So, uh, but up to um, I guess I probably built that about what eight years ago or something. Yeah, I think so. Maybe a little longer. And that was Charles Hale um, was the designer, and we built it on a on a four by four little trailer. And it's it's designed to store my pots, and and then it also unfolds to also be my show booth. And um, and it's kind of sat for a little while. It needs to get a little bit of TLC, um, but it's still functional. And I I plan to cut it down and make it a little smaller than it was, a little shorter. Um, so it's a little easier to haul around, but, uh, yeah, that thing's awesome. So, um, the first time I debuted, it was at the Texas clay festival and, uh, we packed up and I did a couple laps around everybody else still hauling all their stuff out. I can put, I can hook it up to a dolly and pull around like a wagon and then hook it up to my truck and then leave. 
and then I don't unpack after it's over. It just stays in the trailer. It's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, I've always tried to figure out ways to work easier, not harder. So um, I don't think I have any good pictures of that. That might even be before digital started saving my photos automatically. I'll have to work on getting a better album for that. Um, so I also, right now I'm having a, my neighbor where I used, or I have my studio, he's moved out to Seguin, but uh, his name's uh, uh, Labor, and uh, he owned Uptown Woodcrafts, and he's building me a gypsy wagon, a much uh, five by 10 gypsy wagon trailer. So I hope mm. to do something up in, uh, next summer, uh, have a little bit more play. <laughs> That's the plan. Mm -hmm. What's fun? Yeah. Well, Diana, as you're tinkering in your studio now, we would love to have a, a large pot or two uh, for empty bowls in March. Um, <laughs> you know, so if you uh, if you have the inclination and and uh, want to do some larger bowls, we'd we'd love. Uh, they're going to have a large bowl artist table type of a thing. Uh, we hopefully in March if if the uh, event comes off. Okay, I, I, I would be more. That, I can do that this year for sure. Super, <laughs> I, we'd I appreciate it. Do that for a number of years. I really haven't made pots in three years, so it's it's a lot of fun now to just play. I, but John I, never there, hesitates to ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, I would come pick them up, and we get them to our storage spot too, Diane. Okay. When you get them done. Okay, I'll put it on my list, definitely. <laughs> Very good. So that actually uh, prompted me to have a question. Like, so you talked a lot about being really burnt out at the end of the project. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you would have done differently to decrease that? I mean, it's probably to an extent it's inevitable just with such a big project, but would you do some, anything different on the next project to kind of mitigate that at all? No, I, th I think it was inevitable. It was just so much clay to, to process through and so much work. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, at the same time, I was, I got a full-time job. So I'm also working, teaching uh, at Northwest Vista. And that wasn't always in my plans, but the opportunity appeared and uh, it meant health insurance and, you know, a little security. So um, I balanced all that at the same time. But um, no, I, I think... It, it, I don't think I would have been so burnt out if I wasn't also building that studio because that takes a lot of mental energy to coordinate mm -hmm. everything, get your permits and get your, you know, work with CPS and order all that stuff. And so permits? that was a lot. So, um, no, I think it's just inevitable. I think, you know, you, it, you just tell yourself it's not going to last forever. Just like this COVID mess. Yeah. <laughs> Bad, but it's not going to be forever. <laughs> Yeah. Well, so if no one has anything else to ask Diana anymore, do you want to, Pamela, you want to remind everybody of your sale online? Yeah, sure. Um, first, you know, I, Diana, I just want to thank you. This has been, this has been just lovely. My pleasure. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I personally, I really appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank um, you all for having me. Yeah, it's been good. I've seen it twice, and I think it's fascinating. I, you know, I'd love to see it again. Yeah, it's but thank you so much for giving us your time repeatedly. Yeah. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, it's it's nice to revisit again, and and every time you tell it, it is like childbirth. Each time, it doesn't seem like as big a deal. <laughs> so. But anyway, so uh, we our online sale. Um, the deadline to enter was last night, so I'm building the web page now, and the the online sale page from our website will go live on the 14th. The links will go live on the 14th, um, and the plan is for them to stay up at least through the end of the year. So, unlike Texas Clay Festival, we're kind of thinking that this is maybe, you know, the beginning of something that can be a little bit more um, enduring. Um, but we're specifically working with SAMA to support the, the traditional holiday market that they um, have for their members. And so we've got curbside pickup that's going to be available for pots that are bought before the 21st. 
So their members can buy from a number of artists and they can they can go down on the 28th and pick up you know everything from all the different artists. So um, the curbside pickup will have a deadline, but the actual sale site should be up and folks can do holiday shopping there and whatnot. Um, I am gonna be uh, creating some content for social media and we are asking folks to help us spread the word by posting um, notices on their social media accounts. And so I'll be sharing that. Um, Diana, you know, I'm gonna leave it to you to decide whether that's something that you wanted to put on your social media. I'll give it to you, but you decide if you think it's the right thing or not. Um, but, you know, we're just trying to use what resources we have to get the word out and, and begin the process of supporting our members to sell online. So this is a bit of a crawl, walk, run. So this is the first step so that folks, a lot of folks are building their sites for the first time um, and just really trying to support members as they find new ways to sell their work. Kudos to you to get it, for getting it done though and yes. pushing everybody. Yes. Little I guess, Pamela, on that, on that note, Ron at Roadrunner said he's gonna, uh, he's got his online gallery set up and he said that anybody that doesn't want to horse around with uh, uh, building their own website, he could have his employees post a lot of your stuff for yeah. you. Just a good thought. Yep. It's good. Yep. Yeah, I think there's a number of relatively easy alternatives, but I don't, I, they're not actually easy. You know, <laughs> everything requires some effort. Well, I think us aged folks, maybe not so easy, but. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I was a I was a technology architect for 26 years, so you know, I'm not scared of the technology, but it still takes just it just takes some work. You know, you have to if you figure. Let's see, Benner I think has maybe 100 150 pieces, and each piece needs what three or four photographs that now have to all get edited and descriptions, and it it's just mm -hmm. it adds up. It's a real I think it's a real problem for potters when we make unique work, you know, it, an online store when you sell a pair of Levi's, well, every Levi's is like the other. So you put, you put all the effort in and it's good, but here you're putting all the effort for each individual piece. And it just like, I just, uh, I don't I'm trying know. to talk better into making a line of pottery that's repetitive and he's just not interested. I know it's, it's a dilemma. <laughs> Y'all remember that Lynn Belisle on her website um, has a whole section for us on how to build a website, all the cool things that make it a lot easier. Um, and so don't don't hesitate to go there. Hmm. Oh, so when she spoke to us, she had put a lot of things online. And you go to Lynn Belisle, B-E-L-I-S-L-E, uh, Lynn was only one in and go into the section for SAPG. Jill, can you send me that link and I'm going to put it as a link from our website so we don't all have to try to remember it. That's a good idea and I will see if I can find it in a minute. But she, you know, she went to some work to set it up for us. Plus she's such a good resource if you're stuck. Because she's too nice to tell you no. <laughs> I think it's a fantastic opportunity to just not have to mess with it at all. Pay them a gallery commission at Roadrunner and friggin' they handle the shipping, they handle the pictures, they handle the dimensions, they handle all of, all that tedious junk with their employees. Wow. Yeah. yeah, that's my plan. I think it's like 20%. Yeah. I wish yeah. I had known that. I would have signed up. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> I think because like I don't want to do it. I just don't. I'd rather be making things and that's that. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. All right. yeah, that's all I had about the online sale. So um, mm -hmm. if, if the folks here can help us spread the word and I'll send stuff out to all of the members once I have the content ready so that basically you can just sort of cut and paste and maybe put your own touch to it. Cool. Good. Anyway, I'm yeah. on for I'm on for next month uh, doing horsehair firing and I'll I'll uh, I, I don't have many pictures. Uh, you know, I'll have to really do some some fast studying to beat uh, what Diana's put together for us. So. 
Now I'm scared. <laughs> oh, I'll be fine. Google Photos. That's my. <laughs> if my if my uh, leg is allow allows it, I'll come help you do all that, John. No problem at all. Just let me know. How are you doing, Scott? Well, I'm a week in the freaking hospital. I'm going insane because no one can come to me or anything. But got stuff like this to do. Yeah. Well, hang in there. We're thinking yeah. about you. Well, thanks. I'm glad we had the program for you today. Uh, yeah. You know, anything something. to break up the time, right? Right. Yeah. Break up the time, mm -hmm. please. Thanks, Diana. Yeah, and get well. I think I saw on Facebook that you really—it was unexpected, right? Did you did you fall? I can't remember. Well, I'm kind of a knucklehead. I'm out there roller skating with my little kids and uh, mm -hmm. fell on my hip. Yeah. It's okay. And they, ended up, they ended up having to replace it, right? Yeah, I got a brand new ceramic hip, boy. Wow. Did John make it? That's good that John, ceramic. did you make the hip? Handmade by John, right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, well hang in there. And that is one of the nice things about Zoom is you never would have got to come to this and we wouldn't got to see you without without that. So I would have totally been making stuff today and I would have missed the Zoom meeting, yes. Anyway, yeah. Right. <laughs> well, can we better. sneak some clay into you? Well, yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. So okay. Lynn, Lynnbelisle.com under more. It says SAPG is one of the headings. Okay. And she set up a section for us. You know, the other thing that I have had to learn is Photoshop. Um, you know, digital photos are great, but they do require some editing when they come out. And so, you know, maybe we can have a little tutorial on sort of just some of the basics of photo editing one day. And I need mm -hmm. a space that has like, it's all set up ready to take pictures. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I, I haven't taken pictures forever because I'm- You know, Diana, well, I, I, have a, I have a paper roll, a gradiated paper roll, you know what I'm, I, I'm pretty sure I have one out in the garage. You can have it. If I can find it, you can have it. <laughs> it's huge. It's huge. It's like, it's it's really big. Cool. Yeah, that's can, my, my next plan is to set up a little photo booth in the new space. Um, mm -hmm. So I have a place all the time. Mm -hmm. So Valerie Larson Lore has one set up in her office, her um, medical billing processing office. We took all of the pictures for the um, clay, clay and art show last year. Excuse me. Um, but we could get some pictures of her. So she's got several different backgrounds that you can use. Uh, she had she has a lot of different things for a setup that mm -hmm. that were they leave it all year round. Um, and the glass people and now the clay people sometimes use it. You know, Diana, I know you you're working to kind of uh, offset some of your fixed expenses. If you end up with a mm -hmm. with a photography setup. I'm guessing you could rent it to folks by the hour so that, you know, they could take mm -hmm. advantage of it. Just be another income source for you. Yeah. 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 Cause Valerie is out next to, um, uh, Michelle Steele's place. And, um, you know, there, there's a constant demand for all that. Yeah. Maybe one of the people renting from me has a, would be interested in like doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I mean, that's what I need to do. Is get one of those kids to like be like, oh yeah, I'll take photos for a fee. But the go. my, my favorite runner, I delivery just got here. I gotta go. Either, so. Bye. 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 Yeah. Okay. Well, thank y'all so much. I'm gonna go out and thank do a you. bike ride and enjoy this beautiful day. It sounds like a good plan. Yeah. Thank you Thank again you. for joining us. Yeah. We'll see you everybody next month uh, to watch John burning himself up with the horsehair clay or whatever. You're doing this with a trash can? Yeah, I've got a couple of barrels out in the backyard and uh, we'll we'll do some horsehair. Uh, we'll do some, some stuff, I guess, uh, during the session. Okay, very good. We'll look forward to it.
Thank you again, Diana. It was wonderful. Thanks, Diana. Bye, everybody. Bye now.